The psalm assigned for today is Psalm 146. I know usually we do not do the psalm in the service, but I thought this one really spoke um, to our nation at this transition from one administration to the other. So let us read this responsively. I will read the light print and invite you to join in the bold print. Hallelujah, praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in rulers, in mortals in whom there is no help. When they breathe their last, they return to earth, and in that day their thoughts perish. Happy are they who have the God of Jacob for their help, whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the seas and all that is in them, who keeps promises forever, who gives justice to those who are oppressed and food to those who hunger. The Lord sets the captive free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind, the Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord cares for the stranger. The Lord sustains the orphan and widow, but frustrates the way of the wicked. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, throughout all generations. Hallelujah. Today's gospel comes to us from the gospel according to Mark in the 12th chapter. And if you want to read along, it's in the Pew Bible, but also in your bulletin. Please rise as we hear Jesus speaking. As Jesus taught, he said, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogue and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The Gospel today tells us about a poor widow giving her last two coins as an offering to the temple. In the King James Version, these two coins were called mites. You might have heard the story referred to as the one about the widow's mite. Many preachers, including myself, have used this story to encourage sacrificial giving. This gospel always comes around in November when congregations are working on their budgets for the next year. The widow is a great example for the kind of generosity and faith we would love to see in our members. We are not reading just about the widow, however. We are also reading Jesus' harsh words against the scribes. The two texts belong together. These two events happened back to back in the temple in Jerusalem. Hearing Jesus' criticism of the scribes first gives the widow's offering a different meaning. Jesus accuses the scribes of hypocrisy. They con they are concerned with receiving recognition and respect from others. That's why they wear their temple vestments even when they go shopping in the marketplace. They worship At worship and parties, they demand the poshest seats, the VIP treatment. When others are in earshot, they say extra long prayers in order to show off. All this is bad enough. But then Jesus adds this line. They devour widows' houses. What is Jesus referring to? 
One commentary I read pointed to the historical evidence for scribes taking advantage of widows, charging high fees for legal work, work um, cheating on wills or mismanaging widows' estates, or actually taking widows' houses when they couldn't pay their fees. One professor put it this way, Jesus has a go at the scribes for milking their position, making a show of their own importance, and enjoying the praise of others. And yet inside and deep down, they are ruthless parasites, sucking the wealth out of the poorest to keep themselves and the system that enabled them in power and privilege. Jesus condemns this. Immediately after his tirade, Jesus sits down across from the treasury where faithful people deposit their offering. Along comes a poor widow and places her two meager coins into the treasury. And one can almost hear Jesus shouting, see, see what I mean? See what they are doing to this poor widow? Those invested in the temple and its culture demand that all believers give their contributions. They preach that a right relationship with God demands gifts, money, animals, or share of the harvest. You owe it to God, they preach. The temple needs money to function. As someone flippantly put it, those long robes the scribes like to wear need to be paid for. And so a poor widow feels pressured into giving her very last bit of money to the temple. Why wasn't there a scribe standing at the treasury telling her not to do it? Even more importantly, why wasn't there a scribe standing at the treasury giving her some money? That is what God would have expected of his faithful people, especially of those who ran the temple. All throughout scripture, God watches out for the plight of widows. Without a husband, son, or father to protect them, they were extremely vulnerable. And without set males to provide for them, they were a drain on the community. They stand for all who are financially poor and socially helpless. The laws of the covenant, God demands that Israel takes care of these people. For example, in Deuteronomy, God says, For the Lord your God is a God of gods and the Lord of lords who is not partial and takes no bribes, who executes justice for the orphan and the widow and the who loves the stranger, providing them with food and clothing. You shall also love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. And also later on, Cursed be anyone who deprives the alien, the orphan, and the widow of justice. The prophets repeatedly thunder against Israel's failure to do this. For example, Isaiah says, You princes are rebels and companions of thieves. Everyone loves a bribe and runs after gifts. They do not defend the orphan, and the widow's cause does not come before them. Today's text takes place in the temple in Jerusalem. It is the holiest place in Israel, the place where God's presence dwells. Jesus enters that temple in the previous chapter, and immediately on entering the temple, he overthrows the table of the merchants, and he quotes Prophet Jeremiah's sermon against the temple having been turned into a marketplace instead of a house of prayer for all nations. In that same sermon, Jeremiah calls out the leadership for oppressing the alien, the orphan, and the widow in this place. In the text right after today's pericope, the disciples marvel at the large stones that make up the temple, but Jesus tells them this is all going to be destroyed soon. So all of this taken together, Jesus' message is that the temple leadership has completely lost its way. They have lost sight of what it means to be the people of God. It should not be about personal respect or posh seats, about long robes and show-off prayers. It should instead be about caring 
for widows and orphans. Misguided as they are, they have created a system that exploits the very people they're supposed to serve. This abuse has to stop, Jesus says. A system that expects the poorest of the poor to put their last two coins in the treasury so that others can walk around in long robes has got to stop. This is not what God wants. God always looks out for those who are vulnerable in any society, and God expects God's people to do the same. I bet most people didn't even notice that widow that day in the temple, but Jesus did, and he spoke up. Who do we overlook? Who needs us to speak up for them? Jesus holds the scribes accountable, calls them out on their ill deeds. The yardstick he is holding up to them is, how are the widows doing? As people of God, we are called to care for all people, especially those on the margins. We need to hold up the same yardstick against today's leaders. The Biden-Harris administration has three months left in office. We need to look at their policies and proposals and ask, how are the widows doing? The Van Trump Vance administration will take office in the next year. With anything they propose, we need to ask, how are the widows doing? When leaders on any level make decisions or don't make decisions in regard to climate change, we need to ask, who is being affected the most? How are the widows doing? When a new highway or power line is planned that threatens to dispossess people or cut neighborhoods in two, we need to ask, who is being harmed by this proposal? How are the widows doing? This week's election exposed great tensions and divides among our citizens. Many felt and still feel anxiety. Some of us rejoice at the election results. Some of us are saddened. We all might wonder what to do next. I found today's psalm helpful. It begins with praise of God, a great reminder that any Pondering any action, any resolve must begin with God. In our praise of God's love and mercy and power, we find comfort. In our prayer to God, we find guidance and assurance. Next, in verses 3 and 4, the psalm urges us not to trust in rulers. Yes, they do have power, but only for a season and not over everything. And then the psalm describes what God is up to in this world. Justice for the oppressed, food for the hungry, freedom for prisoners, healing for the blind, support for those bowed down, and care for the strangers, orphans, and widows. This work of God goes on no matter who is in the White House. People of faith are called to be part of that work of God. The psalm describes whom we should place our trust in and why, and what it looks like when God's justice is embodied in the world. We are invited, called, urged, encouraged to seek where God is active right now and then become part of that work. On Tuesday morning, during our open sanctuary this week, I had a conversation with one of our faithful members. She was wondering if we are doing enough to help God's people in need. She related three incidents where she encountered immigrants in need and was able to help a little, but still felt dissatisfied, felt like there had to be more. Might we, as the people of God in Calvary, be called to become more active in God's work with immigrants? Where might you or I be able to make a real difference for the kingdom of God by blessing God's overlooked people? Might it be donating money or food or Christmas gifts? Might it be advocacy in our schools or counties or at the state level? Might it be gathering people from different backgrounds or parties together who are willing 
to really understand each other's positions. I would love for us all to ponder these questions. Do it at home in prayerful deliberation. Do it with fellow church members in discerning conversation. How are the widows doing? Jesus' question can be our guide. Jesus models for us how to serve without regard for recognition or respect, but dedicated to love the people who need that love the most. In baptism, we receive the power of the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit helps us see the people who are often overlooked. That Holy Spirit gives us power to enter their lives in a way that blesses. In focusing on that calling, we might overcome the befuddlement many of us have experienced since the election. I, for one, felt numb and confused, scared and rudderless. With today's scripture, God is showing us how we can regain a sense of control, a sense of purpose. We have a mission. We have power from on high to make a difference in the lives of overlooked people. We have the opportunity we have power from on, we have the opportunity to be a blessing and to find in that that we are being blessed ourselves. We have been given a job and the tools to create a world where Jesus, when he asks how the widows are doing, we can answer, they're doing just fine. May Calvary become a temple of the Lord where widows are taken care of, orphans are loved, aliens are welcomed, and all people praise and serve God together, joyfully and generously. Amen.